Hello, this is Philip Myers of Pemi Consulting. Welcome to Strength of Materials for Tank Engineers, Part 3. How many different stresses are there? In this module, I'm going to introduce you to more detail about the basic stress element or stress cube and some stress notation. While it is not necessary to understand this material completely, it's useful to be exposed to it and especially to those who wish to pursue further structural work in tanks, vessels, or piping. Of course, it's also important for those who work with finite element analysis. Recall the stress cube and stress notation. Don't let the term stress tensor put you off. While it can be highly technical, a stress tensor is essentially just a matrix. There are some differences, but let's ignore those for now. You can see how the matrix organizes the stresses very succinctly. Here we show two subscripts for each of the nine components. Nine because there are three stresses on each face. Because of equilibrium, each stress is balanced on the opposite or invisible side of the cube with its counterpart. While this is slightly different than the notation introduced earlier, its meaning would be clear by context and shouldn't generate confusion for you. Here we show two subscripts for each of the nine stress components. While the two subscripts are the same, such as sigma xx or sigma yy, that represents the normal stress. And we can write sigma yy as simply sigma y sigma x here and sigma z for the normal stresses. When there's a double subscript, the first subscript is for the face the stress is acting on and the second subscript is the direction. So taking sigma y x, this is the y face. So sigma y is on the y face. It's a shear stress and it's in the x direction, which is this direction here. The same holds true for the other shear stresses. You can see that for shear stresses you have to have different subscripts because one of them is for the face that the stress is acting on and it will always be acting on the orthogonal direction to the first subscript. In most cases for shear stress we use tau instead of sigma but we keep the two subscripts. I'll show you later that the order of the two subscripts for each shear stress does not matter. That means that sigma xy is equal to sigma yx. This is because shear stresses on orthogonal planes are always equal. So this stress is equal to this stress. This stress is equal to this stress. And this stress is equal to this stress. Those are orthogonal planes. So shear stresses are always equal on orthogonal planes and it's called the complementary shear stress principle. It's important to reducing the number of stress components when we work in stress analysis. Let's look at the plane stress element shown here. We want to understand if there is a relationship between the two sets of normal and orthogonal stresses generated by the forces F sub X and F sub Y shown on the element. Even though we show the element lengths DX and DY, we must realize there is thickness to the element. This thickness is typically not shown because there are no forces acting on the Z plane. Recall that when converting a force to a stress, you must have area, so we need to have the dz dimension to compute stress. Then we can sum the forces to zero, since the stress element is in static equilibrium. Let's start with the x direction. We'll sum the forces, all acting in the x direction, and we have the stress sigma x times the area minus sigma x, which is acting in the other direction, times the area on the back face is equal to zero. This shows that the stress is sigma x here is exactly equal to the stress in this direction. Just a quick word about sign convention. The stresses are tensile, so they're positive, but the force 
is positive here and negative here. The same thing can be done for the y component and for moments we realize that these forces are passing through the middle so that the sum of the moments is zero since the moment arm is zero. What this means is that normal stresses are independent of one another. F sub x has no effect or influence over F sub y and vice versa. We will again borrow the basic ideas from statics to consider shear stresses on a shear element. If we sum the forces in the x direction, we have that tau xy will be equal to tau xy. If we do the similar summing in the y direction, we also have that tau yx is equal to tau yx. This shows that stresses on opposite sides of the cube must be equal. If we take the moments about the corner shown here, the moments drop out for these two shear stresses. And we can see that for equilibrium, tau yx must be equal to tau xy. This is called the complementary shear stress principle. And this means that shear stresses are not independent. They are dependent. The basic rule is that shear stresses on orthogonal planes, even in three dimensions, are equal. Here is the stress cube again. Based on the previous discussion, we know that we can generalize to what we've called the complementary shear stress principle. This states that the shear stresses in any two orthogonal planes are equal. Much of engineering relies on the simplified plane stress model because it works so well for many structures like tanks, vessels, and piping. Using this principle reduces the number of independent stresses that we have to deal with. We see that tau xy is always equal to tau yx, and so on. We've reduced the nine stress components to six independent values. And for the plane stress model, the 2D model, we've reduced four components down to three. The plane stress element matrix is typically written this way. Summarizing what we've learned, we've learned that tensile stress is positive and compressive stress is negative. But that's not the case for forces acting in opposite directions on a stress element. Orthogonal faces of the stress cube have equal shearing stresses, and that's the complementary shear stress principle. That allows us to take the nine stress components on the stress cube for 3D and reduce it to six independent stresses because of this principle. For the four stresses acting on a plane stress element, they become three independent stresses because the two shearing stresses on the stress square are equal. And finally, many, if not most, problems can be solved by the plane stress model, making analysis simpler and more straightforward. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.